Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, Waveform AI with special guest Logan Selby, co-founder and president of DataShift. Logan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate uh, appreciate you, and thanks for having me on. Hey, Logan, we had dinner the other night. We were thrown together at a dinner table. We didn't know each other. We sat next to each other, and we got to talking, and I went, this is super cool stuff, what you're doing. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about your background. Where do you come from, Logan? Give me a, like a two- or three-minute, hey, what's... Where, who is Logan? Where did he come from? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I spent most of my career in the intelligence community and the uh, DOD, uh, mostly as an intelligence officer. Um, I spent time overseas. I uh, lived overseas for an extended period of time um, in Germany and then uh, did several different deployments. I supported a bunch of different organizations throughout the intelligence community during my time. Um, I'm still actively involved on the defense side. So currently a um, the lead for autonomy and robotics uh, for an organization called the 75th Innovation Command. Uh, we're a direct reporting unit to Army Futures Command, but we're reserve element. So I'm a reserve officer uh, in the U.S. Army. Um, but I left full-time government service uh, back in 2018 and spent some time in the Fortune 500 environment, um, worked for some startups um, in the robotics community. And um, about 2000, in 2020, I, I started advising for Data Shapes as a defense advisor because we, at that point in time, knew that our, the technology that Data Shapes had was um, a, a perfect fit for the defense community. Um, and then we got an injection of capital in 2021, which allowed me to come on full time to run the company in 2022. So I've been at Data Shapes since full time since January of 22. Um, but on the academia side, um, you know, I have a master's degree in data science and applied machine learning um, and a PhD um, in, focused on autonomous systems. So hence my hence my attraction to robotics um, for the for the DOD. But um, do a, do a lot of work um, still for the Army, like I said, as a reservist. So I'm actively involved in what's going on in the, the autonomous systems and robotics community throughout um, industry, academia um, and throughout the DOD. Oh, that, that's awesome. Now, why why move away from super cool robots? So I've always into had data a, shapes. Yeah, I've always had an attraction for AI. Like I said, on my my master's program was really focused on applied machine learning. So I have a huge attraction to to that side of the business, which I, w- I wouldn't say is fully separated from the robotics community. But it's definitely oh no no it's it's, it's tied to it. Uh, it's yeah. definitely a hardware versus software um, uh, equation there. Um, but but no, uh, Data Shapes has a very unique technology that solves uh, a very critical need um, in the defense community and throughout some other industries that I, I saw right away. Um, so it made sense um, for, for me to come aboard. Um, I felt like I could really push it and get it to the, the place it needed to be. And we're, we're, we're thriving. So we're, we're finding our place in the world and, uh, and turning a lot of heads um, doing so. All right. Before we get into, into data, let's talk about AI in general. When people hear about AI... They're hearing about chat GPT, generative AI, large language models. It's all the rage right now, right? Mm-hmm. And chat, we know chat GPT can conquer the world, right? They've already proven that. They scared everyone. There's a moratorium, supposedly. No one's doing a moratorium. <laughs> everyone knows that. That's just their way of slowing everyone else down. Um, what are your opinions on just the AI, AI in general? And then I want to talk a, a little bit about at your guys' approach, which is very different. Sure, sure. You know, so AI has been around for a long time. Um, it's been, even, even deep learning models that, that people like to throw around now, you know, deep learning has been around for, for a long time as well. Um, I think now, you know, we're at a place in, in society where the amount of data that's available to be pushed through some of these models for training is, is, um, is extremely vast. So that's why we're, we're getting some of these um, very, very smart systems like chat GPT that can do a lot of these different things and, and kind of on demand. Um, and the computing resources have, have evolved to a place too, where they're readily more readily available. Um, I would say, um, to, to allow people to do these things, but it still requires a lot of resources. Um, it, it's, it's an expensive thing to run. 
Um, you know, I think chat GPT costs somewhere between, you know, three to $5 million a day, um, just to, just to run it. Um, now then that's, that's just, just, just to spit out what we already know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there's, a, there's a lot to it. Um, but, um, I, I'm, I'm happy that AI is getting, getting the attention that it is. Um, I, I'm definitely not on the, the team that we need to stop it. I think it's, um, I think it's, evolving at a rapid pace. And I think we have to have an understanding of how it's going to be used and what it's going to be used for uh, and who's using it. But I, I definitely don't think we need to put a moratorium on it at this point. Um, so I have a question about that because most of most of the AI that we hear about today and, and people in industry and outside of industry have always heard of neural networks, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're listening to, um, oh, we need the program to operate like our brain operates using neural networks and the whole concept behind it. That's the big push in AI today. Would you say that's true? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So um, neural networks, you know, if, if you're unfamiliar um, to the audience, you know, neural networks are essentially, um, you know, layered parametric equations that are stacked on top of each other to, to perform a duty um, utilizing mathematics. The, the, the problem with neural networks is um, you don't really know how or why uh, a decision is made. So you, an input goes in, um, it, is, it is worked through the network, and then you get an output. Um, and there, it's really hard to tell um, why that output is there or how it got to that conclusion. Um, you may be able to point back to the data that the model was trained on to say mm, potentially why this output was, was given based on this training data that was shoved into the model. But um, there's really no auditability there. So the, the explainability is, is, is kind of non-existent. Well, yeah. And that I remember um, there were some court cases around this specifically, mm -hmm. right? How can we trust a, a convoluted neural network? How can we trust any of the neural networks that are out there? Because I have no proof of accuracy. I have no way of determining how it got to the answer that it got to. Exactly. And especially on the defense side, um, in, in other industries as well, you know, where you have um, life limb or eyesight involved, um, you, you know, trusting trusting a decision something's made that could result um, in, a, in a kinetic type activity is is one that you have to be extra cautious on. And so um, having something that's not able to be audited is, is troublesome. Do you think do you think us as a society is going to be able to overcome that? Obviously, I, we already have overcome some of that. But do you think we'll ever get to the point where we fully trust a neural network um, or that I, that technique of AI? Because there's more than one technique of AI. That's what we're going to talk about. No, exactly. Exactly. I think I think we will as a society. I think eventually we'll just assume that risk um, and say, you know, hey, it, it's providing a service um, when it comes to, I guess, more on the consumer side. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get to that place on the, on the defense side unless, um, you know, we see some, you know, 99 Point nine nine percent results, um, statistically speaking, um, you know, but uh, it, it could get there. I think it could get close, but I think we're still a ways away. Neural network, that's the big buzz of the day. We even have chips at Intel that do neuromorphic processing because, mm -hmm. I mean, that that's that's where every all the research. Well, all the big money is right now. Mm -hmm. But you guys have a different approach. We do. I, I, I love this approach because it's a simple approach to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not um, following the crowd. I love people that kind of go against, against the grain because you spit out and you have this wonderful new technology that, that does wonderful things. So explain a little bit about why you guys decided when you first started looking at your use cases, why you decided to go this different route instead of the traditional neural network route. Sure, sure. So, you know, Data Shapes is, is mature um, in its technology. So we've been around, um, our, our, I would say Data Shapes um, as IP has been around for about a decade. So our original engineering team uh, got together a, almost 10 years ago now and developed the technology that we have today. Um, and so that when they first looked at some of the pain points that were around at the time, um, they realized that they could be solved with traditional machine learning. So um, looking at you know, your, your data science 101, your k-nearest neighbor type, type algorithms, um, support vector machines, things like that um, that you hear about in, 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 like I said, data science 101. Um, but they took that technology and they evolved it um, several, several, um, several layers ahead, I would say. And, then, and that's kind of where our secret sauce lies as far as our patents go. Um, but they found that those simple approaches were able to, um, number one, solve a lot of problems 
quickly, uh, efficiently, and in many different environments. So, uh, you know, at, at 10 years ago, the, your resource constrained environments were even more so. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot more resources that uh, are available, but you still, um, people still need solutions that are on the edge, that are um, able to be used in austere environments where there's no networks, that where people are getting dirty. Um, you can't carry a, you know, you can't jump out of the back of a plane with a server stack. Uh, and so, you know, you're, you're going to need something that's able to be um, trusted, um, used in these environments, and that's extremely efficient. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little more about this, but, you know, our, our solution is also um, auditable, um, which is another big factor. Like I mentioned, when it comes to these kinetic type activities, you can, you can audit the entire workflow. So you know why it's making the decision that it's making. Exactly. You know, from the initial training instance all the way through the workflow to the output, you understand why the decision was made and when and who trained it um, and so on and so forth. So this is interesting because you use some of the same terminology that we use in, in traditional neural network training. I'm training the model, right? I'm doing inference. You're using the same terminologies, but the underlying technology is fundamentally different. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's it's um, the, the some of the methods we use that, you know, people in the machine learning and AI community will understand is um, we use a lot of zero to few shot methodologies. So we're actually learning in real time or near real time. Um, so whatever data set we're looking at, the data is coming in. Um, we're either using something that's supervised. So an individual is actually looking at the data coming in and training that model in real time. Um, I always draw a box because I think about our UI. So an end user would be drawing a box around an item and then telling the system to learn it in real time uh, versus your neural net approach where it takes a lot of labeled data that's collected, you know, thousands of images or thousands of, um, you know, whatever type of data that you're trying to learn it takes a, a lot of it to feed it into the model so it then can learn. And then at the end of the day, that model is brittle because it, it's only as good as the training data that you fed it. Um, so then if it's something, if your, your output is wrong or it's incorrect, you have to go back and retrain that model and again. And retrain it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to actually un, untrain a neural network. Exactly. So, and so we're doing it in real time. So if something is wrong, we can counter train in real time or you know, teach it something else or don't show me this. So that would be an example of a counter, tra counter train. So don't now, show why, me this. Why, so, so why doesn't everyone just use this stuff? Why is everyone focusing on neural networks? Um, well, I think, you know, the, our, our methodology isn't a panacea. I would say, you know, there's definitely um, some, the neural net solutions out there are, are great um, at things. I, I would say, um, and you're, you're hearing about a lot of them today. So we talked about, you know, language models, large language models, um, chat GPT or, or image, um, you know, neural networks are really good at those things. Um, that, that technology and that science have, has been around for years. Um, so it's been perfected. Um, still resource heavy. Um, they, they've, they've come up with ways to get it a little smaller. Um, how w we are utilizing our technologies, we're focusing on an, a completely different segment that others don't really talk about, and that's waveforms, waveforms and signals. Okay, so, so that's, why, that's why you can really focus is because you're saying, I'm not going to do a general AI, right? I'm going to focus on a specific type of input that comes into AIs, which is waveforms. Correct, correct. Yeah, so we, we are um, hyper-focused on on waveforms. And when I when I say waveforms, it, you know, a lot of people think, um, especially if you're talking to some, like a, somebody with a physics background, they'll say, well, an image is a waveform uh, as well. But, you know, we're, we're talking um, metaphorically, you know, the, the, the actual vis visual representation of a, of a waveform that happens in the environment. So, um, you know, UV, EEG, um, radio frequency, um, vibration. Even even voice, right? Uh, even, sound, right? Even sound. voice, sound, yeah, acoustics. Um, so that that's that's the realm we play in, and that's where we've really focused this technology. That's really cool. This kind of reminds me of you guys are like a specialist. Mm -hmm. So if I I come from a family of doctors, so I would not go to my my brother who's an oral surgeon, a specialist, to have my appendix taken out, even though I know he can because he's done general surgery rounds. But if but I wouldn't go to a general surgeon to to have oral surgery done, to have my jaw replaced or whatever like that. So you guys have had you guys have specialized um, your AI to certain types of problems 
and input that that, that you're looking at, which yeah. I think is wonderful. And that that's a perfect analogy, you know. So there's there's some neural net based solutions out there that have that that try, and I, I think they do um, a decent job of of waveform analysis. But essentially, the way they do it is. Um, through image, so they are they are taking an image of the waveform. Yeah, they take an image and drop. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they're comparing it to other waveforms. So it's it's very general. So they're generalizing it just in that process, let alone. Um, so you know the way we're doing it using our technologies, we're actually digesting the waveform. So we're taking uh, what we call metrologies, um, which are measurements of the waveform. We're attaching metadata to that waveform in real time, which allows us to um, not only um, learn, learn everything that's happening in the waveform, but allows us to query it. Um, so then if we run our AI through oh, any cool. historical database of waveforms, you're able to do correlations in real time uh, of anything you've collected historically as well. Okay. So let, let's talk. It sounds super cool. Um, I know you guys are using vector processing and things like mm -hmm. that because Intel's got vector, uh, vector processing technology that you guys can take advantage of. Okay, and we talked a little bit about this. But let's let's not go too, too geeky. I'm going to lose half the audience if we do that. Let's instead look at what can I actually use Waveform AI for? Sure. What sure. use cases? I mean, what, I mean, you said sound and and any you know. IR, any, anything that produces a wave that are waveform, but what can I practically use it for? Yeah, so so two two industries that we're working in right now that are complete polar opposites. Um, one being defense. You know, I've I've mentioned that a couple times. So on, on the defense side, we're we're working we're working in uh, signals intelligence, electronic warfare, um, different types of acoustic signatures, um, things for on, on the intelligence side of the house in defense. Um, but then we're also working in the entertainment industry, which is completely different. All right, let's talk about entertainment because this is going to be more in it. Well, it'll be more entertaining. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of work in music. So we're partnered with some um, some labels and some other organizations throughout the music industry to um, look at copyright and artist attribution concerns. Um, and so, oh, interesting. Yeah, because it, it's that's a, you know audio, like you mentioned, is a waveform, and pe people don't necessarily think about it like that. Um, because there's a lot of solutions out there that that try to compare um, audio audio um, tracks for you know sampling and copyright and things like that. But the the way we break down the waveform allows us to um, take it to the next level. Um, so there's issues in in music today where um, even with just the generative AI stuff that's out now, um, there was an article that came out today about it. Um, but um, generative, generative AI uh, aside, you have um, social media influencers today that are they're, they're taking artists' original tracks and then they're transforming them in a way that can't be recognized by other software. And so they're taking, you know, you know let's say Taylor other Taylor software Swift. that's doing just straight pattern match. Yes, right? yeah. So they're taking like a Taylor Swift song, for example, and putting it on a putting it on their their content, but they're transforming it so there's nothing that's attributing that track back to Taylor Swift. So there's, you know, royalties and all these things that are owed to these artists every time their songs are used that they're not getting because it's not able to be understood. But the way our technology works, the way we break down the waveforms, we actually learn it in a way that we can pick out transformations um, of the songs, which is is currently from our understanding, there's, there's a couple of companies that are dabbling in it out there, but we've really, um, really honed it in um, and have a, a extremely, extremely uh, robust solution. So that goes to detection. I'm hearing it does. Right, well, I can I can use your I can use your um, technology to detect different types of waveforms and relationships in the waveforms. Correct. That's, which is pretty slick, I have to admit, because um, if we go to the Department of Defense, one of the techniques that people use is they use modulation or frequency shifting to get rid of of uh, to to spoof or confuse um, AI from uh, pattern matching. But you guys could look at, at uh, relationships in the waveform itself, which would be harder to uh, harder to spoof, which Correct. is pretty cool. Correct. Yeah. So that's, that's one, uh, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, jamming and spoofing, there's, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, we've been in the Middle East for um, 30 years. So the, the um, we haven't really had a, a near peer adversary that we've came across um, 
uh, up until now that has a technology on the offensive side of electronic warfare. Um, so that's a new you know area for us too that we're really trying to dabble in to really pull more intelligence out of uh, on, on from a defensive perspective, an analytics perspective of, ele- of electronic warfare. There's a lot of intelligence there to be gathered that's not not really been exploited to date because there hasn't been a software like ours um, pulling that that intelligence out of the waveform. Oh, that, that's super cool. All right. So detection, is that your main thing? Is just, I, I shouldn't say just detection. It's a big deal. Um, can I do any transformation from, from these waveforms as well that you guys are detecting? I mean, what, what other things can I do uh, with it? Um, so, so we are, um, you know, we have a pretty robust platform that does the detection. Um, because our software, um, our technology is so lightweight, we're actually able to, to embed it on different things. Um, so we have, um, you know, just for our, our product profile, you know, we have a, um, a software that does the analytics, it does the detection, it does the um, really the intelligence gathering, it allows you to do correlation. But then you can also um, create applications that then can be exported to edge devices. Um, and that software can be the, the mothership software, like we call it, the actual product where you're doing that um, can be done on, you know, a ruggedized tablet. It could be done you know, on a laptop, and then you can create these executables that can go down to the microprocessor level. Um, where so, can- so that that's cool because I can really push applications out to the edge, completely disconnected, correct, and still get all of all of that information, including self learning. Right. Exactly. So that's that's the, that's one of our other products that's a big deal. Um, that that is um, that we call Infinite Loop. So it is a, a self learning anomaly detection, still a detection, um, but it's essentially you know deploy and, and let it go. So it's a self learning um, application where it will establish a baseline um, continuously. So based on the parameters that an end user would prescribe. So if you want to deploy it and have it you know, listen or monitor or whatever you're going to assign that duty to be, it will continuously and, and self-learn that environment that it's deployed in. That's pretty, is there any way that um, these edge nodes can share their models with other edge nodes that are maybe listening in a different place? Oh, absolutely. Is there any way to correlate those models together? Because my brain is like going, I could deploy this easily into a car that my teenagers are driving. Exactly. Yes. Because right? so, yeah. it's a waveform. The way they drive is absolutely a waveform. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's fast and slow. There's, you know, there's everything, right? And, 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 and speaking of, speaking of, you know, vehicles, we've done some use cases in the past, some, some POCs with the automotive industry. Um, and that's been one of the use cases. You know, the way, the way that we're collecting our data, you know, we can, and, and the way that we can be embedded, we can be embedded on every sensor. So today, you know, the, the so average, so cool. the average sensor count on a vehicle coming off the assembly line today is like 80, you know, that's, that's yeah. average, you know, Tesla probably being at the, at the top of the range, but you know, average is around 80 and think of all the data that's being collected constantly. One of the issues though, and another issue that we saw with our technology is the, the vast amount of data that's being collected, there's not really a pipe big enough to push that data back. Um, or it wouldn't oh, come be, it on. Wouldn't five, be cost 5G effective. is going to solve all that. <laughs> it, would, it wouldn't and, be cost and then effective. 6G. No, Let's you're say. right. So, so this, is something that, this is something I've been touting as well. I want to push analytics out to the edge. So I can still get all the valuable information without moving all the data. Exactly, exactly. So that's, and that's one of our other products we have called Global Edge. And, and Global Edge is essentially a, an intelligent agent that sits on that sensor or just behind the sensor. Um, and it conducts, you know, the, your, your normal um, ETL operations. So extract, transform, and load of the data that's being pulled at the, at the collection point. But then our machine learning is on the back end of that, which actually um, reduces the data even more and then filters it for the insights that the end user wants, um, which will allow you to push that real time intelligence back, whether it's on a vehicle, it's on a, you know, some type of defense collection platform, um, or it's on you know, a piece of machinery in a factory. Uh, so you're, you're actually getting the data that you want and kind of weeding through the noise. So you're not constantly pushing stream data back that's irrelevant. Well, and, and so I have a question around that because some people would say, but 
there might be something special in that noise. So we're able to we're able to capture that as well. But uh, you're able to capture the anomalies in the noise, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, we're able to capture oh. any anomalies, any insights, but then we can capture that that um, that big picture data too, so it doesn't go away. We can retain retain the the collection. Uh, the normal collection, it just won't be obviously won't be pushed back to the to the headquarters in real time like the insights would or any anomalies that would pop up in the noise. So the, this also helps with data compression on the edge to to the data exactly. center. I can have I can have uh, what do we call it? I, I've got a project I'm working on now that has reinforced collaborative learning, reinforced collaborative learning. Because I've got all these edge nodes that are that are out there doing their own learning. Right. Mm -hmm. But I want them to share. Exactly. Yeah. So we've we, we've um, ran through a couple different exercises where, um, you know, the way that the data is being pulled back with whatever whatever data framework that you want to ingest this or digest this into, because it doesn't have to be our software. You know, we can plug it into whatever data framework that you want. Um, but we've um, since we have that self-learning, um, there are ways where you can you can um, kind of cross pollinate or, or share um, the learned data across your portfolio. Uh, across the deployed. portfolio, yeah. So it's super cool, super cool. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned that it's small. How small is small? So the the smallest to date that we've um, scaled it down to is forty seven k. Whoa, that, whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> this will run on my 64 Commodore? It will. It will. So we've... That we've, is pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. So historically, you know, prior to getting into defense and entertainment, we actually worked um, a lot in healthcare. And so we um, came up with some products um, a, a few years ago that were um, looking at handheld PCR devices. So, you know, mouth swab detection. Um, and we were looking to detect um, hepatitis C, um, and we were doing that on a, a small little cartridge. Uh, and so we were able to scale the software down to around 47, 50K um, to make that detection. Um, so obviously, the more complex you, you would want your, um, ML ops or your ML operations to be, um, you would uh, probably scale that up a little bit. But we can keep it factored You can keep well. it pretty... So that's you just brought up another thing. You guys can do virus detection with this. We can. Yeah. So that's um, in, in that example, we were detecting hepatitis C just based on UV waves being refracted. Yeah, I was going to say, of yeah. 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 That's that's pretty that's pretty darn slick. Now, see, you guys have opened up this big, huge aperture for me because now I'm thinking, wh what other crazy things can I do that that come in waveforms? There's a lot of things that come in waveforms. We talked a little bit the other night at, at dinner about image and video processing. And you said. Could do it, but yeah, it's not optimized for it, right? It's not that'd it's be not. like going that'd be like going to my brother for an appendectomy. He could do it, but he doesn't have all the right tools. Um, he hasn't done them in years, so I want to go to someone that knows how to do that. And exactly, yeah. I mean, like I said, the science on those two areas have been around for, for a long time, and not not that it hasn't been around on on waveform and and, and that type of um, environment too. But it's one that we are obviously specializing in, and that's why we're we're trying to stay extremely focused right now in defense and entertainment. Uh, there are industries that we plan to scale this out to um, down the road. Um, one being, yeah, I think we'll get back into healthcare eventually. Um, but, um, uh, energy is another one that, that we're interested oh. in, uh, down the road because current is a waveform, you know, so we're able, oh, to, uh, absolutely able to monitor is, yeah. current at, at a very granular level. And we, we've tested that and it works rather well. Um, so that's one that we would like to get into eventually. You know, I, I have a feeling the defense world might drag us in that, in that direction anyway, but, um, that's, that's one we're, we're holding off now. Um, but we've been asked lately, I've been getting a lot of questions about, um, very, uh, so different types of waveforms that we don't necessarily experience on Earth. Um, so a lot of like oh. space, space wave, gravitational waves, um, you know, electromagnetic type waves that are being emitted in space. So that's another um, another area that we're, we're being approached about, too, which is super maybe maybe you'll find SETI. Maybe. Yeah. No, that's, that's maybe. One, yeah. That's there, one. There group, you go. Uh, we, we would love to we would love to chat with. I know uh, my, my co-founder. Um, and I are very interested in that area. So I think it would be fun just to have the conversation. No, no, this, this is really, really cool stuff. Um, Logan, you, the conversation we had at dinner just carried on on the podcast, which is wonderful. I, I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. You have anything else? Where can people find out more about data shapes um, and, and find out more about um, 
what you guys are doing. Yeah, I know. So um, our website, uh, datashapes.com. Um, you can look us up on there. You can request information, request a demo. Um, we have a pretty active LinkedIn profile as well. So you can check us out on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, but we're, we're trying to, to build our presence. Like I said, this is we really just started our go-to-market this year. Um, so we we're just now starting our marketing campaign. So a lot of people don't know about us yet. Um, so we're trying to spread the word and um, um, trying to get out there and be a little more visible. So, um, yeah, reach well, out. Well, mo- most definitely you guys are someone to watch in the future. Um, even I would say watch right now. Don't wait. Watch these guys. Uh, I think I think uh, you've you've got something unique here that is exciting, and I most definitely am going to do uh, uh, some more due diligence with you guys. Well, I appreciate it, Darren, and thanks for having us on. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast. Give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.